Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, um, our discussion about the life and legacy of uh, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm here, luckily, with uh, two of my favorite people, uh, Professor Nadine Strassen of New York Law School, Kathleen Paradis, um, uh, also of New York, not law school. Um, professor Strassen, uh, in addition to having been an incredible constitutional law professor who I had the uh, I was lucky enough to have as my constitutional law professor. She was the first uh, woman president of the, of the American Civil Liberties Union, also the ACLU, and that she did that for nearly two decades. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard University and Harvard Law School. National Law Journal uh, has named her one of the country's 100 most influential lawyers. Um, and uh, Professor Strassen, her relationship with, uh, I guess I say Justice Ginsburg, uh, goes back for a very long time. Uh, she uh, worked with the late Justice Ginsburg at the ACLU when Justice Ginsburg worked on the Women's Rights uh, Project. Um, she describes her, the late Justice Ginsburg as her heroine and a role model. Uh, and um, they, were, they, were, they were friends, they were good friends. And Kathleen Paradis, now a, a senior partner at, is it Outen? Outen and Golden in New York, uh, where she chairs the firm's sexual harassment practice group. Uh, Kathleen, uh, has been uh, practicing as an employment lawyer uh, for the last three decades. Uh, and she succeeded uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg as head of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. They also were very good friends. Um, and uh, have, uh, these both of these women have a lot of stories about Justice Ginsburg. We will talk about Justice Ginsburg's, um, her jurisprudence, and we'll get to that. But I also wanted to make sure that we talked about Justice Ginsburg as a person. And I couldn't think of two better people um, to discuss um, their relationship with the late Justice Ginsburg uh, as a person. Uh, so welcome to both of you and thank you both for, for agreeing to do this program today. Uh, before we get into the questions, I would remind everyone, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we are going to take questions at the end, but uh, by all means, uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, there's not CLE for this program, uh, at least not yet. If, the, if we do end up going deep into uh, the jurisprudence, we might uh, look to get some CLE later, but I thought it would be better just to talk about uh, what an esteemed person uh, Justice Ginsburg was. She touched me as, 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 a, as a jurist. I know she touched both of you. Um, and so why don't we get started? Um, let's see, I have a lot of questions. Uh, and so I'm just going to pick some of them. Um, and so I'll start with you, Kathleen. Uh, how do you think uh, Justice Ginsburg would have been influenced um, if she had joined the law firm uh, as a first year associate. I know she tried to do, to do that, at least she should have done that in 1959. She, she was not offered a position at, at, at a law firm then because she was a woman. Um, what do you think uh, would have happened if she had? You know, that's a scenario that I've actually thought about. Uh, as we know, one of the things that really shaped her uh, among, of course, many is the rejection that she experienced. As we know, she just, she couldn't get a job. She graduated at the top of her class at Columbia. She couldn't get a job at a law firm. She uh, uh, couldn't get a job as a, uh, she couldn't get a clerkship. Uh, and I wonder whether if she had gotten an offer at a big Wall Street law firm, whether she would have just been a great lawyer at that law firm and not gone on to smash the walls and ceilings that she actually ended up smashing. Uh, I, I'm uh, uh, 10 years younger than she, and I joined a big law firm in Southern California out of law school. And I was not able to do the public interest work that I wanted to do. Uh, she would have gone into a law firm even earlier. And I don't think she would have been allowed to do the public interest law, for, uh, law work she might have wanted to do. Uh, so she might have just been a great lawyer and we wouldn't have heard anything more oh. from her. It's possible. That's a plausible scenario. I, I actually agree with Kathleen. If I could add a perspective, in early 2018, at her invitation, I had the great honor of conducting a public interview of Justice Ginsburg, Ruth, as we called each other, and Kathleen, obviously, as well. Um, she had been invited to give a lecture there, a titled lecture that many prominent people had given in the past. And she wrote back to the dean. And she said, I'm not interested in giving a formal lecture, but uh, if Nadine Strassen is willing to conduct a conversation with me, well, twist my arm, um, <laughs> I'd be happy to do that and uh, to prepare for this wonderful event. And many thanks to Tony and 
Kathleen, this is a great opportunity to be with both of you and the audience. Uh, to prepare, I read the transcript of that interview I did with her and it, it refreshed my recollection uh, that she had not always been angered or even particularly bothered by gender discrimination. I say this not in a negative way because I, I also grew up you know, a, a younger, but there were still so many ways that women were treated differently from men. And I, I, it didn't make sense to me, but I sort of, it was like an emperor's new clothes kind of thing. I thought, well, there's something that I'm not getting about this. So I was really amazed when I saw that, you know, as recently as when, in, in, I mean, as late in her legal career and she had already gone to law school and 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 Harvard Law School only had uh, restrooms for women in one of the classroom buildings but not the other classroom building so if you were taking an exam in in, in, in the chances were 50% that you would have to go to a different building to use the restroom i mean there were just so many injustices and yet she didn't protest or think of protesting and even after being denied opportunities. Uh, so I asked her, you know, what was it that flipped the switch that made you go from, from just accepting this to becoming an activist against it? And Kathleen, she mentioned another, a number of factors, but they would not have come into play had she gone into a law firm. One was when she was at Rutgers, um, other people on the faculty came to her and brought cases to her attention, uh, building on her expertise as on civil procedure. They thought she would be a great litigator because of that. It wasn't because of substantive knowledge or concern about women's rights. Uh, likewise, it was a group of students at Rutgers Law School who asked her to teach the first course on women in law. She then went to the library and she said, spent a relatively short time reading the whole there body of case law. There wasn't much. And then she went to Sweden, right? And that Sweden was, was a big influence. That gave her a vision that she didn't see in America. A vision and that of would have happened if she, had, if she had gotten a law firm job. Yeah. Right. Wow. And, and you know, to the, thank all those law firms for their discriminatory <laughs> practices. <laughs> um, you know, and she, I, I, I noticed as I was, you know, doing my research uh, as well that you know there was she was very. Um, careful about her approach um, to how she how she brought cases before the Supreme Court. She had the, the very, you know, the one step at a time, the very incremental approach. And there was only, I think, one time where she'd seemed to be a little bit more uh, um, not to not use that approach. In the Frontier case, she didn't use that approach. I think, at least to me, it seemed that she was a little bit more, um, uh, she was much more uh, uh, aggressive in, the, in with that case and the way she argued it. And I wondered for both of you, um, having, you know, done the work that you've done in constitutional law. Do you agree with that approach? I mean, that's also the approach that, that was used um, by, you know, in, in the Brown, by, by Justice uh, Marshall um, in terms of the way he, he, uh, he argued his cases as well, leading up to Brown. Is that an approach that you both uh, agreed with or adopted easily or? or I, would say, I would say not only that it's a winning, uh, a winning approach and a winning strategy, uh, very seldom is there a frontal assault uh, that just suddenly in, in a revolutionary way changes everything. There's always, a, it's always a little bit at a time. But I think even more important is that was Ruth's personality. She was not a radical person. She was a very conservative person. Uh, she was able to talk to these conservative judges on the Supreme Court as a, as a litigant uh, because she, she was in the same place as they were. She wanted them, she, she preferred taking one step at a time. That was her, that was her, uh, her demeanor and, uh, and the kind of person she was. I'm, I, this gets away from Ginsburg specifically, but I'm trying to think if there's an exception. Was there ever a, a more frontal radical assault on established doctrine that was successful? I, I, I really can't think of a counterexample. So um, I think I agree with Kathleen. That's not what made her special. What made her special was that it also meshed with, with her personality. Okay. Um, let's see, what would I like to ask you? You know, she had this relationship with, with um, 
with Justice uh, Scalia, which was, which by all accounts was, was really, they were fast friends. Um, do, you, do, do either of you know how that came to be? I mean, how, how did the two of these, who appear to be diametrically opposed, at least uh, in terms of the way that their jurisprudence, is it, was it the writing? We talked a little bit about this before we started. Uh, do you know how that came to be? They were on the DC circuit together uh, and they shared a lot of interests. And he, I think they connected very early on, even though uh, their legal principles and legal approaches couldn't be more different. Uh, they, there was a, a spark between them. She just really enjoyed his company. He made her laugh. She had a deep respect for his seriousness. He was a very, he, he, he loved the law and so did she. And of course he loved the opera and so did she. They, they went to the opera together many, many times and were supernumeraries at the Washington Opera. Uh, I think the fact that he made her laugh, the fact that they respected each other's seriousness and the fact that they shared this really passionate love of music, that's enough. <laughs> True. I, I, I also think that knowing how uh, both of them took the law so seriously, but also loved it so much. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I knew both of them, but I never asked them about this. So this is my speculation. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they affirmatively valued the opportunity to challenge themselves and their own understanding against somebody with uh, different views, but also very thoughtful and well-considered views. I think about this because we hear so much today about uh, intellect, the lack of intellectual heterodoxy that's uh, affecting campuses and all the social scientists and scientists who say that, you know, the best way to arrive at a correct result in any field, certainly including law, is to, is to hear different perspectives, to test your ideas against those who have different perspectives. This goes back to John Stuart Mill, right? And the one really dramatic example that I learned about from uh, Ruth's uh, eulogy to, to Nino, as he asked me to call him, um, at his funeral was it so inspiring to me. It was his very strong dissent, okay, vitriolic dissent, <laughs> in the historic VMI case in which she finally was able to bring to fruition the argument that she had made in Frontiero, Tony, right? I mean, all but that, that gender-based classification should be treated almost as presumptively unconstitutional as, as race-based classifications and VMI came pretty close to that. She, and, and so she told this story that I hadn't heard before that um, she was going on some trip right before the opinion was gonna come down a long plane ride and Scalia made a point of dashing down to her chambers, giving her the, his latest draft of his dissent and he said, here, I want you to have it for the maximum amount of time so that you can, you know, give it the most thoughtful response. I thought wow. it's so telling, isn't it, about both of them as individuals and about their relationship? Well, I think right. that it certainly highlights that their differences were, were uh, ideological and not personal. Uh, I, there's an opera that was written about the two of them. It was called, I think it was called Ginsburg and Scalia or Scalia and Ginsburg. But the, the line of the, one of the main arias is that they, they both sing, both of the characters sing, we are different, we are one. And that line just gives me the chills. Yeah. Do you know if either of them particularly influenced any particular decision? In other words, uh, did did he did did uh, if you know did Scalia take a position on any particular case and persuade Justice Ginsburg in any way or vice versa? Do you have any idea? Certainly not in constitutional cases, but they may uh, that that may have happened. Nadine, you might know in cases in aware. other areas. You know the 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 only instance I can think of, Kath is for some anniversary, major anniversary of the Women's Rights Project, there was a long interview that somebody at the ACLU conducted of Ruth, and uh, she talked about how Rehnquist and others of uh, his, his ilk um, 
I think this was before Scalia was not mentioned in this context, but Rehnquist and others who had been on the court for a long time and had initially uh, voted against any heightened scrutiny for gender-based classifications, right? It should just be treated the same as, uh, you know, any property or commercial regulation, mm -hmm. right? rational basis review, almost automatically constitutional. Why did he change? Why did Rehnquist join her opinion in uh, the VMI case? And, uh, and she said it, it was because of not only the presence of women on the court, but also as, as justices, but also uh, the presence of women in the courtroom arguing as lawyers and also their own daughters were growing up, some of wow. them being uh, lawyers. So it was that, you know, being able to relate in a personal way. Again, it's, it, it wasn't ideology. It wasn't driven by ideology. That right. Scalia's got eight <laughs> kids, I think. There must have been some daughters that he must have had some daughters or some kids who who didn't yeah. agree with him. But what, what, I, what I don't know the answer to, I'll bet um, uh, Linda Greenberg would know the answer to this, uh, whether they influenced each other's uh, uh, conclusions in cases in other areas, like you know administrative law or admiralty law yeah. or God knows right. what, but not constitutional law. Um, okay, this is a question for Nadine, being a constitutional law professor. Um, were there, is there any one of, um, Justice Ginsburg's decisions that surprised you in constitutional law? Yes, uh, and I, I, when you asked me, you told me that you might ask that question, I remembered the case, but uh, I didn't remember its name, and now I looked it up. It's uh, Bennis versus Michigan. Does that ring a bell with you, Kathleen? It's not very well known unless you're focused. Is that the father? The father from yeah, yeah, yes. Well, well, I, I, this it was a civil asset forfeiture case. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a terrible decision. I, I, <laughs> five to four decisions, and she was uh, in the majority, so she could have made a difference. But you know, civil asset forfeiture where one person who owns the property or has a property interest um, commits a crime, and then the property can be completely confiscated. So that right. is, is a due process problem. But in this case, it was a husband who and father of a couple young kids. And what was the crime that he committed on jointly owned property with his wife, namely a car that they jointly owned? He had sex with a prostitute in that car, and wow. the car was confiscated, even though she owned it and she was dependent on it for driving their two young kids to and from school. And we thought, you know, this is not only a due process case in terms of civil asset forfeiture, but it's an, uh, you know, a, a, a deeply feminist case. I mean, this is like going back to the old common law notion of the wife is subsumed with the husband. And I was, I, I, I didn't have time to look up if anybody had interviewed her about this. I certainly never did. Or if there's any explanation, she did write a concurring opinion, but I didn't, you know, but I didn't find it any more persuasive than the majority <laughs> opinion. Uh, you know, and I'm gonna broaden that to, uh, to, to Kathleen. Is there any- you No, know, I could, yeah. There, uh, I, on this, uh, yes, go ahead, ask your question, but I do well, have another, it's another thing to question. Bring. It's essentially the same question. What, what surprised you is what case of hers, if any, that you went, oh my gosh, did you, what, what were you thinking? Uh, she, uh, uh, in her Madison lectures, as you both probably recall, on uh, a critique of Roe versus Wade, uh, and one, one element of her critique was that the Supreme Court stepped in and made its decision in a manner that sort of stopped the political momentum that was gathering uh, speed and uh, momentum. And if the Supreme Court hadn't done what it did in 90, uh, uh, 91 or 93, in 90... Well, for Roe, 73. 73, 73, I mean. If the Supreme Court hadn't done that, all of that political momentum might have... Uh, uh, given more strength to the, uh, uh, the pro-choice movement, more changes state by state, and a more secure securing of women's right to choose. That was her view. Mm -hmm. Nina Toten, uh, not Nina Totenberg, Linda Greenberg has presented yes. Yes. with what? The Greenhouse. Greenhouse, I'm sorry. Linda Greenhouse presented her with massive evidence to the contrary. 
most recently, not very long before she died. And I know Linda was extremely frustrated that Ruth said, that's very nice, but I don't buy it. <laughs> so it's so interesting because I, um, Linda asked me specifically about the interview I did with Ruth, because you may remember, Kathleen, I asked her that question, do you still have that critique of Roe? And she kind of ducked the question, but Lin that, Linda was fascinated with that one question. Yeah, Linda was, Lin Linda to, to, the, to Ruth's dying day was so upset with herself that she hadn't been able to persuade Ruth that she was wrong. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, either of you, her, your funniest moment. What, what do you do? You remember a time when when she just was was just funny? Oh yeah, I can remember a few times when she was funny. Uh, some of them I can't really describe. She was very. She was very upset with, uh, no, I, I, can't, I really can't say these things. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> None that you can say. No, I'm sorry. I can't. If it was a kind of a sense of humor, it was very, very dry and very understated, which is uh, may have passed me over. And I would say, so I don't, certainly don't remember in any professional um, settings, any humor and in social settings, it was Marty who was, you know, great. Oh, he was yes. hilarious. Right. He was the funny one, right. We had an experience. Uh, I interviewed her at an event in Stockholm in, I think it was 2019. Uh, and this is, I hope the story isn't too long, but you might know that uh, Vladimir Nabokov was a big influence with her. She loved, he, he taught her how to write. He taught her that word order was extremely important. And one of his examples was in English, you say white horse. And so you say white, and as soon as you say horse, you see a white horse. In other languages, you say horse white. And as soon as you say horse, people see a brown horse. So <laughs> Nabokov loved English because of word order, including that. So we were in Sweden and there was a sculpture of a white horse in the, in the window of this restaurant. She loved it, very sort of Swedish spare. And I said, then you shall have it. And I took the horse, I went up to my room. She said, you can't do that. You can't take the horse. She was going crazy. She said, I'm the justice of the United States Supreme Court. You can't steal the horse when I'm sitting here. So I took it up to my room. I tried to persuade the hotel manager to sell me the damn horse, which he wouldn't do. Oh. <laughs> but then later, Jane managed, oh, the Swedish ambassador found the sculptor, got another horse, sent it to Ruth, and now I own that horse. Wow. <laughs> she left it to me <laughs> on her death. Um, I, 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 got a, I saw something in the chat from one of my colleagues uh, that said we should probably identify Linda Greenhouse. Um, near, Linda uh, Greenhouse was a Supreme Court reporter the for the New York Times for years. In my opinion, I don't know if you agree, Nadine, she's the best Supreme Court reporter the New York Times ever had. She was just great. She now yeah. teaches at Yale Law School. And she's she, she, Sorry. And she, she does a column er, er, every other Thursday, I think. She, she still does. Writes, she still has a column for the Times, but she was the beat Supreme Court reporter, and she was great. Wow. Um, and not a lawyer, interestingly enough. Not again? a lawyer. Oh, I didn't realize that she was not a lawyer. Oh, I didn't not know a lawyer. that. Wow. Um, Kathleen, so the Women's Rights Project, um, yeah. what was it like working with her uh, in that capacity? Well, I didn't know this isn't what life was going to be like for the rest of my life. I thought, wow. oh, this is how it is to practice law. It was, wow. it was amazing. It was thrilling. It was uh, uh, high cases of high importance all the time. We, the Women's Rights Project did other things. It wasn't just Ruth's Supreme Court litigation. Uh, and she oversaw it and she advised us and she was around quite a lot, even though she taught full time at Columbia. It was terrific. It was, uh, it was some, some introduction to the practice of law. I bet. <laughs> and, and, and Nadine, when, when she was at the Women's Rights Project, were you at the ACLU at that point? No, no, I was, I, I met her when she had just started the Women's Rights Project as the founding director when I was a law student and she came to speak at Harvard Law School 
she made an indelible impression on me and one that uh, relates to her jurisprudence as well as to her, her litigation strategy. Uh, she explained, as she has done um, recurrently since then, when she was deciding to um, apply some of her talents, I say some of her talents to, mm -hmm. to litigation on women's rights because she continued to teach, right? She continued to teach first at Rutgers and at Columbia. And the idea was that she was doing each job half time, but knowing her, she was doing each job Stop, full time. Half time. Um, and, and why did she choose the ACLU as the basis, the, the home base for her women's rights litigation? And she said she considered uh, the specific women's rights organizations that existed at the time, the National Organization for Women and the Women's Equity Action League, but consistent with the goal to make women's rights an essential, recognized as an essential element of human rights, uh, she uh, chose the ACLU for, for that reason. And she continued very much to uh, anchor her work uh, in the whole panoply of, of human rights, not just specifically gender-based uh, rights. And, and uh, I want to point out, it's not as well known, it's quite well known that her connection to the ACLU was through the Women's Rights Project. I don't think it's nearly as well known that she was also a member of the ACLU's National Board of Directors, which sets policy for the ACLU on every single issue. She was also one of the ACLU's three uh, general counsel that also advised on, on every issue. So during those years, she was not only litigating on women's rights cases, but she was involved in some of the ACLU's most important cases uh, in other areas, to, to, to mention one that is probably familiar to many people, uh, the Skokie case from the late right. 19th. 1970s, defending free speech rights, even for Nazis, even in Skokie, Illinois, a town with many Holocaust survivors. And uh, she continued to be very, with the exception of the one case I discussed, <laughs> um, strongly supportive of due process and free speech, as well as the equal protection rights. Uh, are you, and this is for both of you, um, I, I found it surprising that her work uh, for the ACLU did not come up at her confirmation hearing. Um, did you guys expect that would be an issue? Yeah, she, she expected it. And she um, was ready. Marty got on the phone with me. I was president. Her husband, Martin Giz Ginsburg, a fantastic uh, person and larger than life personality and, and probably the most prominent and successful tax lawyer in the entire country. Uh, he was her campaign manager even before she was nominated. And um, and she gives him enormous credit, right? Full credit for, for, for bringing that about. I mean, obviously she's extraordinarily well qualified, but that's not enough. And he was, uh, as part of his campaigning, I know he gave you assignments, Kathleen. Uh, the assignment that he gave me and others at the ACLU was to unearth every single record of every action the ACLU had Taken during the time that she was connected to it, including through the board of directors and as general counsel. And as you could imagine, it was a monumental amount of material. And no matter who you are, you could find plenty of controversial actions the ACLU was taking them for, you know, uh, just pick your poison, right? And so uh, she was completely prepared to answer a lot of questions about that. Uh, and in fact, the number of questions she got about her ACLU work was a great big fat zero. Astounding. Yeah, I, I'm surprised by that. Um, and Kathleen, what, did you expect that? Was, was yeah, I, I, I certainly expected it. And uh, the, uh, Marty ran a great campaign. The assignment that Marty gave me, this was really quite a, a war room that, uh, that Marty assembled. The assignment that Marty gave me was to... Uh, uh, round up feminists because uh, there was opposition. Uh, some uh, Clinton famously said during the time preceding his, deci his decision who to, who to choose, he said, the women don't like her. And, wow. and that, was, that, that was a problem. There were feminists whom I have not forgiven to this day, <laughs> although Ruth forgave them, who were just giving her a hard time. So little by little, we had to bring, and, and we- Yeah, uh, we, I mean, was, was that because of the Roe versus Wade position? Yeah, 
Yeah, it was mainly that. It was mainly that. But also, Ruth was not radical at right. all. Uh, and the ACLU did nothing, really, on, uh, uh, I mean, the Women's Rights Project didn't do anything on LGBT stuff. There was a separate LGBT project, but the Women's Rights Project wasn't doing it. Uh, we did nothing. On, the Women's Rights Project did nothing on race. Ruth was very, a very mainline radical feminist. <laughs> Wow. Um, is there anything that you wish you had asked her that you, that you didn't? Uh, you know, I think I, I wish I had asked her. She lost a case in the Supreme Court. The second Supreme Court case she had, she had six, she won five, but the loss was her second case. And I wish I'd asked her whether that was devastating. If it was, it didn't show. She just moved forward. But I, uh, you know, that was, that's quite a thing to lose your second case and, and just keep moving on. Kathleen, I thought I had the answer to this, but I saw on Tony's list of questions for That's you. gonna be my next question. Oh yeah, okay, because I, that she apparently didn't want to argue that case. She saw that it was- Oh, I, yeah, I know the whole history. We tried oh, yeah, like, tell to us. kill it. We tried to kill it. It came from the Florida Civil Liberties Union. You weren't the president yet, Nadine, no. Uh, and, and you know, in those days, there was not uh, perfect control over what the affiliates were doing. And that case, uh, the Supreme Court granted cert before the national office even knew about it. So it's not a case she would have ever brought. It's a case that she uh, would like to have erased and it was a very tough case and it turned out to be a loss. How did she try, how did she try to, to, to kill it? Uh, she tried to convince the, uh, the litigant and the local, uh, uh, what do we call them? The cooperating lawyer to, uh, to, to withdraw. But of oh, course wow. they weren't gonna do that. Right. And, wow. and forgive me for not remembering anything about the case. Was it that this was too dramatic a step? It wasn't consistent. No, it was a tiny step, but it was it was it was trivial. It was a widower in Florida who wanted to get the fifteen dollar tax exemption that widows got. It didn't have any of the resonance of uh, acknowledging the value of the woman worker. All of her cases had to do with the value of women as workers or women as uh, service members. It was all, the core was always about stereotyping uh, 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 the value of, of a woman. And this case just didn't do that. Hmm. The, the question that I would have, wish I would have asked her is for a really detailed, concrete explanation of how she managed her time and how she managed to do so many things so well. And she even if it sleep, meant, I was going to ask, even if it meant how little do you sleep? Uh, because the astounding thing to me, you know, Kathleen and she were very close. She and I were fairly close. Uh, there were many people with whom she had only the most tangential connections to whom she still devoted so much time and attention. And I say this from firsthand experience because I'm talking about, you know, anybody who was a member of the ACLU National Board, which by the way, until recently had more than 80 members at any time, um, she would welcome, you know, if they said, well, we're gonna be taking our grandkid to uh, Washington, can we meet you in your chambers? And she would say, yes. You know, or to a student who said, you know, I had Professor Strawson and she spoke so highly of you. Can I visit you? And she would say, yes. Wow. She answered letters from my students. When not only would she always provide uh, tickets for uh, Supreme Court arguments, but my students would send thank you letters and she would answer their thank you letters. I mean, it was extraordinary the degree of time uh, and attention to, to individual human beings as well as to humanity writ large. Wow. Now, I, I have a question. It's funny that you, you mentioned thank you letters because Nadine, I always was amazed at your ability to do that uh, when we worked together. Um, is there a habit or trait that, that you learned from Ruth that you still use in your, in, in, uh, in, in your work, either of you? Are you asking? Oh. And both of you, either one. 
I aspire to be one one hundredth as gracious and generous toward other people as as she was. I don't have this. I mean, I have the desire, but I don't have the time management ability or the ability to go without sleep. If you think that accounts for part of it, Kathleen, I think but that's I hold, part of it. That up as a model. She was extremely meticulous. I. Uh, I think I learned I learned that from her, and I certainly am not as meticulous as she is. She is she was so meticulous. I remember a, a few years ago when we were doing something together. She brought me a reprint of something that she had published years before, and she had marked it up to fix typos. And I said, Ruth, this was nine years ago. Why are you why are you doing this now? She just she just couldn't help it. She couldn't <laughs> help it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, those who worked with her, Kathleen, not you, and I can't remember who it was, told me that uh, she was such a I mean, demanding of herself, right? So, uh, but then if you have written a draft for her review, that she would be equally demanding of you. And whoever this was, was so terrified of that. It was somebody who was, had excellent skills and including writing skills. But she said to me, she would always pretend when she handed it in that it was a rough draft because she knew even if she <laughs> was perfect, from Ruth's perspective, it was a rough draft. Well, wow. Ruth corrected her own final draft. She was never finished. Wow. Um, you know, she, she did something that was very uncharacteristic of her. And I'm curious to, to get both of your takes on, 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 on it. You know, she had that time when she made it, she commented on Donald Trump's candidacy. Um, and she had always been quite um, careful about such things. Um, how, how, did that, how did you guys take that? It was a big mistake. And she did it twice. Oh, did she? Twice. I didn't remember that. I remember she apologized for the one time that yeah, she was. Well, she that. apologized after the second time. It was a big mistake. I, I, I think maybe there was something going on in her brain that we didn't even know about then because it was not like her. She did it twice. It was really dumb and it haunted her. Yeah. It was so uncharacteristic. And I think that's an excellent potential explanation, Kathleen, because you know, she was not a spontaneous speaker, right? There was, I found the hardest thing about interviewing her or for that matter, having a personal conversation with her was that she would think before she would answer and you weren't sure, maybe she didn't hear it, maybe she didn't understand it. But on the other hand, you don't want to interrupt this, this thought process. So she was very deliberate in processing yeah. Um, the question, this was an interview. So I, I think that's a, an excellent theory. Wow. Um, favorite memory of her? What, what, what would be your favorite memory of her? That's a oh, question for both of you. I have, I, I have a lot, but one, one very tender moment was really early mm -hmm. on when uh, I just joined the ACLU. Uh, I'm, I'm not just maybe a year and we'd started to get friendly and we had a very personal conversation in which she told me about uh, Marty's uh, illness and what was going on and how scared she was. That was very sweet. I, it's, it's hard to, but let me, let me just say one of my favorites was when I was stepping down as president of the ACLU. The ACLU was kind enough to host this farewell celebratory lunch for me in Washington, DC at the, um, some big convention center there, <clears throat> excuse me. And Ruth and Nino and David <laughs> Sir, three of my good friends on the Supreme Court were gracious enough to uh, come and honor me and uh, the way it was set up was the four of us were, were seated on the stage, facing, uh, sitting at a table facing everybody else. This was during lunch. It was, it was a little bit odd. It struck me as like the medieval banquet hall with the king and courtiers presiding. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the just, I was on stage first and the justices were, were introduced in order. And um, I uh, was trying to get Ruth, Bader Ginsburg, who was rather 
uh, seemed frail at the time um, to uh, to sit right next to me. And she, I, I thought she should have the greatest place of honor as far as I'm concerned. And I remember she whispered to me, she said, Nadine, you got to keep, I think she said boys, Kathleen, maybe she said guys, but I think she said boys. She said, you got to keep the boys apart. Let them sit on either side of you. And they, and then I found out this was two days before um, one of the Gitmo decisions where Souter and Scalia were on opposite sides and wrote oh, wow. very strong words about each other's opinion. And I thought that was so, so diplomatic. Right. <laughs> also, you know, the, the, let's be girls and let's take, take care of these boys right. in their staff. <laughs> Wow, uh, I'm looking at. We have a, a number of questions, so I'm, I'm. Let's let's go into some of those, which are really some really good questions. Thank you all. Um, one of the questions asked: Did she discuss her, her decisions about retirement, uh, not retiring, and staying on, and staying on uh, the court with either of you? Uh, no, but she commented to me frequently on women who were stepping down from the Court of Appeals, especially the Court of Appeals, during Trump's tenure, and she was very dismayed by that. She really didn't want to create openings that he was going to get to fill. I was going, we never had a personal conversation, but again, in preparing for this wonderful event, I was looking through some of my letters from her, and um, it, she wrote me um, fairly soon before she died about her desire to uh, stay on for at least, and then she specified the period until the inauguration of the next president. She also, she also cited, I'm not sure which justice it was, she cited Brandeis or somebody who, uh, who served until 90, and she thought that was a perfectly reasonable goal. I believed it. I, I thought she'd be there till she was 90. Wow. Um, so there's a, these are such good questions. I don't know this case, but I'll ask it um, to see if you guys do. What did she think about the overturning of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez? I don't remember this case. This was another ACLU case, and I'm sure that she was a dissenter in that case. The questioner probably knows. Um, it was a hor horrific case in which um, uh, a woman who had a restraining order against her ex-husband uh, for stalking her and threatening her and, and their three children. Um, and she kept, uh, she kept trying to get the police to enforce the restraining order and they wouldn't, they ignored her pleas. Uh, she goes out one day for a brief errand, comes back and her three daughters are, are gone. And she keeps uh, calling the police and going to the police and they won't do anything. And to make a long story short, he drives up the next morning um, and the three dead daughters are in the trunk of the car. Right. Oh, wow. And this was one of those cases where the Supreme Court said that, the, you know, there's no constitutional remedy here at all. No, no duty to an individual. I, I assume that she was a dissenter in that case, but I haven't reread it. Do you wow. Remember? Hmm. But that's a really good question. And might have, yeah. I think I would have remembered if she had not dissented in that case, the way I remember that she didn't, yes, she didn't. Right? <laughs> that's why the other one was such a shocker. Right, right. Um, so you, you both probably can speak to this question. The question is uh, whether she discussed the difficulty uh, um, while at the ACLU of wrestling the, uh, the, the cases from the male, from the, from the affiliates, wrestling the cases from male lawyers at the, uh, from the affiliates. It says early on, they saw in her papers that, she, that there were a number of, of letters where she was trying to make a case that she should be the one to argue the case uh, before the court. Yes, early on, she, 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 she did have to argue with the guys to, to, because she, she knew she was uh, in a better position to argue than others. But she also argued that she should argue it rather than a woman in at least one case I can remember. Uh, and it was just purely on the merits. It's not her ego. It's mm -hmm. that she knew that she knew how to manage and, and corral the nine people sitting up there on that bench. She knew I, that she I, had This is a generic issue within the ACLU. I mean, it happened quite recently that um, the, the, uh, I, I think I won't go into the details because I don't <laughs> know 
plus the people involved. But um, on the one hand, we want to give incentives to the, you know, the cooperating lawyers who do, devote their time and energy and talent uh, pro bono or even to the staff lawyers in, in affiliates that if their case goes to the Supreme Court, you don't want to take it away from them. And, you know, there's some argument that they're more familiar with it and better able to do uh, an excellent job. On the other hand, there's the concern that, well, the national specialists, including the national legal director, might be better positioned and more experienced Supreme Court advocate. And 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 so this, the ACLU to this day is constantly um, trying to make determinations about who is the best advocate, not only in that case, but looking at the overall institutional concerns. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, this is going to be for each of you. So there'll be one for Kathleen and one for and one for Nadine. Nadine, I'll ask yours first. Um, in the area of constitutional law, um, do you do you feel as though you may have influenced her uh, on any particular case or in any in any particular way? I didn't try to, so the uh, so the answer is no. Um, although that said, I did send her the two books that I've written about. Uh, free speech and, and feminist issues, certainly in the hope of, um, of shoring up what I believe were her intuitions or you know, instincts. I don't know that she had focused on the issues. Uh, one, you may remember, Tony, it may have gone back to our time together at New York Law School. There was a big split among feminists about uh, the censorship of what so-called radical feminists called pornography. Yes. Yes. And some of us more civil libertarian oriented feminists believe that censorship is at least as bad for women and women's rights and reproductive freedom and LGBTQ rights uh, as it is for, for free speech. And that free speech is the necessary tool for promoting the women's rights causes. I believe that uh, Justice Ginsburg was on our side, but I never discussed it with her personally, but I deliberately sent her my book and, and more recently another book along the same lines. Wow, and Kathleen, so your question is, is similar obviously, but it would be the area of women's rights. Do you, do you feel as though you may have influenced her in a general way or in a, or, or in a specific case? You know, I always agreed with her. I don't remember any any case or uh, uh, on a brief or on an oral argument uh, where we had a, a difference of opinion that that was not easily worked out. Uh, no, I can't. I, I I never tried to to convince her of something that we didn't already both agree on. She, I, I do, just, I didn't have, I, I personally wasn't involved, but the ACLU obviously failed to persuade her uh, in our opposition to certain campaign finance reform laws, so-called. Uh, and uh, she was impervious to the idea that the ACLU did not want to have to uh, create a pact in order to advocate on issues. It's against the organization's charter to advocate for or against candidates, but she didn't seem to uh, accept our view that that's completely, that that would undermine the free speech rights of our, our members. Well, yeah, this would be a, a good question for Linda Greenhouse. She'd have a good answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and so another one of the questions that I saw in the chat um, was when she had dinner with um, Nino, <laughs> and his wife, um, did, they, did they talk politics? Do you know? I don't no? know. Okay. I don't when I uh, had dinner with her, I didn't discuss politics, by the way. And that was I on, did. was that on purpose or, or just? It... Probably that there were other more interesting topics. What do okay. you think, Bethany? No, I did talk politics with her. And, and what, what, what were those conversations like? Oh, those, I, I feel like I should probably just keep that to myself. Well, in a general sense, I mean- We didn't, but, we didn't disagree on anything. Okay, okay. We were outraged by the same things. Got it, Understood. And you, Kathleen, you know, since Tony asked whether you persuaded her of anything, uh, you obviously persuaded her about um, uh, Yom Kippur. Yes, I, I did. Oh. But yeah. that was, I, I was thinking about legal things. Yeah, yeah. well, she- when she had been on the bench for uh, a few years, it turned out that Yom Kippur was on a, a sitting day for the court. 
And she asked me what I we thought. She thought claim that this is a Jewish holiday, by the yes, way. It's a very, it's a very solemn Jewish holiday. And if you, if you ever, if you ever observe a solemn holiday by not working, Yom Kippur is the day you were doing. Did Sandy uh, Koufax famously not even pitch during on a right, baseball right, pitcher? Right. I think Philip Roth even didn't work on Yom Kippur. Uh, so she asked me what I thought she ought to do. And I said, I don't think you ought to work. She said, I've always worked on Yom Kippur. I said, but you haven't always been on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and she decided not to sit on Yom Kippur. Uh, and thereafter, the court decided that it wouldn't schedule sitting days on high, on, 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 on the most important Jewish holidays. Wow. So, I mean, so that, you get the credit for that. I, I get the credit. She gave me the credit. And I've got the letter to prove it. There you go. There you go. Um, it's a bit of, I, I think I, this question is, is more for each of you personally. Was there any particular pivotal event that focused your attention on um, practicing in the area of equal rights, advancing equal rights? Say that again, Tony. Sure. The question is, was there any pivotal event? I know Nadine, you had mentioned that you, um, the emperor's new clothes concept, you kind of realized that maybe you were missing something. Was there anything that happened as you started into your careers that, or even maybe even before your career that made you say, uh, Kathleen, women's rights or Nadine, constitutional rights? You mean to, to pursue that path? Yes. yes. Uh, well, when she offered me a job and I, went to work with, and I went to work for her, that's the path I stayed on for the next 50 years. Right. You obviously had been committed to women's rights before that. I, as far back as I can remember, Tony, I defended in what I thought should be individual rights long before I had the terminology. So I was just thrilled when I learned that there are uh, tools and avenues available to, to, to pursue these these causes. I, I regret that, I, you know, I think that kids today are much more bold about uh, challenging the status quo. I think that's fantastic. I grew up just as I said, you know, it's the emperor's new clothes kind of story that I tell on myself. I just thought, you know, I know that there's this equal protection clause in the constitution, but there must be some dimension to it that, that I don't get that explains why women are not treated equally. I, I, I'm, I don't think that happens with young people today. I think they, are, they take for granted that uh, the fact that something is this way or has been this way forever doesn't mean that it's right and that uh, we should do something about it. And that to me is very exciting. When I think of the stuff I just allowed to continue happening, just as Ruth did even uh, uh, 10 years earlier, I'm absolutely shocked. Like when I was in college, the girls had to be back in the dorm by 10. The boys didn't have to be back in the dorm at all. Wow. And we just, we just accepted it as that was the way the world was. When I look back on it, I think, why was I such a wimp? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, Nadine, uh, that you didn't have the, the, the terminology because, you know, full circle, and not that this should be about us because we're really talking about her, but I, that's, I saw Nadine uh, before I actually accepted, uh, uh, um, decided to become a student at New York Law School, I saw you talking about uh, uh, the ACLU. I didn't know what the ACLU was. And as I heard you talk about, oh, that's what, those are all things that I found interesting, but I didn't have the terminology. I didn't know it. Um, so it's, it's, it's great that, that, um, that that's how she influenced you as well, as, or at least how you saw, the, saw jurisprudence. You're like, oh, those, those are words I didn't know, but that's how I felt uh, and, and led you in, the, in that direction. Um, is there anything about her, uh, Justice Ginsburg, Gin, Justice Ginsburg or Ruth, um, that people didn't realize that you wish they had known, or th 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 that you would have liked that, them to understand about her? And that's a general question, but I really just mean: is there something about her personality, something about her jurisprudence um, that you that was not as well known, uh, but but should have been? Well, I, I would say that what emerged in the last ten years. Uh, this meme, this notorious RBG, this personality, this diva, uh, that was something, I mean, this isn't exactly your question, but that was something I would have never seen coming. I never would have thought that she had that in her. 
And right. looking back on it, I have a few ideas of why that was able to emerge. And I think Marty's passing was part of it. Uh, because as Nadine has said, Marty was the diva. And generally there's only room for one in a family. Uh, but I wouldn't, uh, she, given her modest personality, the fact that she loved this role, she reveled in it was pretty amazing. Well, there's something <laughs> funny. I mean, I know that you both said that you were, she wasn't particularly funny, but that was, that whole, she, took she had, that a, she had a great sense of humor. She had a great sense of humor and she did a lot of interviews in the last 10 years. And Nadine has mentioned that she conducted a couple of them, so did I. She developed a wicked sense of timing. Yes, she yeah. knew what worked and she knew how to work the crowd. I mean, she sort of knew that as an, as an advocate, she knew how to work the bench, uh, but she did it for comedic effect for the last 10 years and she was really good at it. She was really good at it. I, I was impressed and, and I didn't see that coming either, uh, um, Kathleen. Uh, Nadine, did you have, when you, when you first realized that, that she had taken on the, the, the uh, notorious RBG moniker, um, how did that strike you? It was, uh, she had often said that if she could have been born as anything, it would have been as an opera star, that she would have been an opera diva. So she didn't become an opera diva, but she had an opera written about her. Right. She was considered a rock star personality. So it was uh, very much the, the, the next best thing. But I think, you know, she saw this, it, this was not a matter of reveling in her own celebrity. It was the idea that her message was being so celebrated by young people, young yeah. women in particular. So it was Absolutely. a way of carrying on her, her legacy. Also, she became uh, toward the end of her career known as a dissenter. And I uh, have often read that people, uh, even you know, legal journalists talked about how, uh, what a big deal it was in her dissent in I can't remember which case it was. One of the one of the biggies, maybe Bush versus Gore, uh, where instead of saying "I respectfully dissent," I dissent, and mm -hmm. leaving out the word "respect." I think it was it was Shelby County. She was but enraged. It, so again, I didn't do this research myself, Kathleen, but I read another legal journalist who said. I've looked at every single one of her dissents since she's been on the Supreme Court. She never said respectfully and then asked her about it. And she said, well, it's not respectful. You make very clear throughout your opinion, that you, you know, you disrespect her ideas. I, I don't know who's right about that, but I'm, I'm intrigued um, because that would have been for somebody who was very polite uh, and, and in, in her demeanor, it would have been interesting if she was the only one on the Supreme Court who always admitted that word. Wow. I think, <laughs> I think that one of the things that turned her to this, this last chapter, the, way, the, the meme and the notorious RBG for the last 10 years, <clears throat> is that she despaired of being influential enough to uh, shape a majority opinion. And she realized that she had no choice but to be in the dissent. She didn't like, she didn't like being a dissenter. She much preferred to uh, contribute to some uh, resolution that a majority could sign on to but it got to be harder and harder and then it got to be impossible. Wow. Well, um, we are out of time. Um, this has been such a good discussion. I, I could probably ask a lot more questions, but I, I thank you both so much for sharing so much. Um, I'm sure that she um, is happy to know that you both are carrying on her legacy and sharing these, these incredible stories uh, of her and, and, and what she's done. Thank you both so much. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you both. And Thank you. It's been a pleasure.